Hello and welcome back to Rebound with Resilience, a podcast dedicated to raising your resilience, mindset, and mental wellness. On this episode, to chat about making mental health in society a priority, I'm honored to invite an ex firefighter, the current MP for Tanjong Paga GRC, and also the parliamentary secretary for MCCY, Eric Chua. Hi, hi Kevin. Thanks for having me on this. Hi Eric, thanks for coming over. I know you have a busy back-to-back schedule. That's right, that's right. Almost every day. Yeah, I mean, I'm so excited because this is the first episode yep. of a collaboration with Safeport at Queenstown. Mm-hmm. Okay, it's a kind of a brainchild of yours where a mental wellness van goes to schools and communities uh, to start conversations about mental health, reduce stigma. And also, there is a unique facial recognition, mood recognition tester that they use to identify emotions. So, um, yeah, overall, I'm excited to chat with you. Maybe, maybe start with that. Let's share more about how you came about with that idea and, and any insights from that so far. So, Safe Port, right? I mean, Safe Port at Queenstown. I mean, mental health has been an imperative that we are looking at in the community. Even before COVID, we have known that mental health is an issue that uh, specific segments of our society, and especially our young people, mm. are very seized about, are very concerned about. Mm. So um, COVID in the past two years, of course, made it much worse yep. for many of us, in fact, for all of us uh, in the community. So what we wanted to do was to raise further attention to mental health. And we've understood that actually, along with mental health conditions, as well as people with mental health conditions, sometimes there can be a lot of stigma. Yep. And the stigma comes most of the time from a lack of understanding about what mental health conditions mean, about what people with mental health conditions can or cannot do. Mm -hmm. So I think we want to raise that level of awareness. We want to have that social conversations. Actually, in the past two years, um, especially with COVID, actually one silver lining that came out from uh, the pandemic was that uh, people are now a lot less guarded when talking about mental health and mental health issues. So we wanted to actually add a multiplier to that and then keep the momentum going. Mm. And hence, save port at Queenstown. Yeah, I've said it before to you, and I'm not saying on the podcast, right, that having a wellness van is something I always thought was cool in other societies where they have physical outfits to chat about such issues so that similar to like dental van, for example, that's everybody right, goes to right. visit. Yes. It reduces, nominalizes it, right? That's right. First time someone told me about it, mm. my friend Ling, I think he worked with mm. her as well. Yes. Ling from... Uh, Project Green Ribbon. That's right. And I was like, wow, I wanted to come down by a clash in. So I'm so happy now I'm actually hosting you, <laughs> getting to talk about this, helping to promote Safe for yeah. Queenstown as well. But uh, apart from chatting about that, we're also going to talk about some gaps, you know, in society sure. and how we can fill them as individuals uh, right. you know, when it comes to mental health. That will be the outline for today's podcast. Mm-hmm. But before going to that, right, I think just some warm up questions to sure. get the audience to know okay, you a bit better. Up, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, just a bit of your background previously. You know, and yeah. why you entered politics as well. Yeah. I, I want to know about your work as a firefighter. Right. In SCDF. Uh, yeah. Um, yeah, share with us maybe one or two stories that left an impact on you. Um, well, you know. broadly, I mean, um, one of the things that really kept me going and really allowed me to find myself was the opportunity to work with a lot of people on the ground. Mm. So throughout my different postings in the SCDF, I have worked with... Um, men and women from all walks of life who are passionate about the cause of life saving. Mm. And over the different postings that I've had, you know, first I started off as a rookie commander and then, you know, taking care of one fire station and then uh, finally a few fire stations as a division. Um, Those postings especially made me realize that, hey, actually my passion is with people. Mm. Um, And that's also, uh, you know, that, that accounts for why I made the decisions I subsequently Mm. made in life. Because I realized that, hey, that process of mentoring and maybe guiding the younger officers, it really gave me a lot of of joy. Yeah, Yeah. that's one. Um, There was a specific incident though. I actually told my paramedic, I I told the the paramedic, well, can I be on the ambulance one of these days, right? Because I'm trained in fire and rescue, but I wanted as head of operations then to know what, you know, our frontliners on the ambulance go through Mm -hmm. day to day basis. Um, There was one call that came. That call was a cardiac arrest call, heart attack call. So 
we were dispatched to this location in the rental flat, uh, what what really gripped me for the incident was that, you know, um, when we arrived in this rental flat, um, there were three persons in the household. I went in, uh, it was generally unkempt. Um, you can play tic-tac-toe on the floor because it's just wow. so dusty. Wow, that's an energy that hasn't, people remember. <laughs> hasn't been, okay. you know, quite clean for a long time. You can tell that it's, uh, housekeeping is not really there because mm. uh, there were rusted tin cans around. And then the three persons was the granny. I remember a 77-year-old granny that was having cardiac arrest, obviously. There was another gentleman in the house which is um, who was in his 50s, right? Um, this is a rental flat and uh, in his 50s uh, from observing him I could quite tell that hey actually I, I think he's probably a person with special needs mm. right so that's um, the second person the third person was actually a very young social baby. worker <laughs> social worker right. she was the one who called us she was the one who was also performing CPR um, on the yeah. granny so we quickly you know did what we could you know followed the protocols brought uh, the granny to hospital once we arrived at the hospital, the doctors were able to find a good entry point, injected adrenaline. Um, lo and behold, the pulse came back. Mm. So the first minute when I heard the news, I was like, oh, I was so happy. It was one life saved. That's exactly yeah. the mission of, of the SCDF, right? Life yeah. saving. But thereafter, I gave it further thought. If she's to be revived and she goes back to that conditions, would she have sufficient family support? Would she be suffering or would she be yeah. with quality? So uh, that gave me a lot of food for thought. Sure. Yeah, as to how you know we can actually really reach out to our yeah. you know, okay. families in rental flats. And I think that was one of the many experiences that led yes. you into, like you said, right. enter politics to make a change, That's right. Right, both in, in policy and also in, of course, being out there on the ground. Right you know, expressing the needs upwards. Mm -hmm. um, what is one insight you have gained since you started serving as an MP? I think it's only been two years. I think I've learned not to judge. Oftentimes when residents come to me, um, I'm often their resort of last resorts. Mm. So it's often when they run out of other measures, they run out of other um, possibilities, they have run out of options, they come to me, they are desperate. Um, disappointed, sometimes angry, sometimes overwhelmed with sadness. Mm. So I've learned to really just suspend judgment. Okay. So a person who comes to you, you may be shouting and maybe even hysterical. Yeah. Um, maybe even very irrational. Very, angry, yeah. very irrational. Um, but you've got to look beyond these yep. emotions. And because what really happened could be that hey, the person could have had a journey of, you know, six, nine months or, or even a year. It's pent up yeah. over, you know, a, a, a certain journey, which we would not fully understand, but we can only empathize. And uh, if we can put the emotions aside and um, really look beyond all this, I think that's, that's a key takeaway for me. It's not easy, even though I say this, because as human beings, yeah. the very first reaction would be to interact with the emotions, mm. right? The emotions that are sometimes being hurled at you at the same time. But I think we got to, you know, really just look past all this. Uh, I call it the, to learn to be Zen. Yeah, yeah. And to really focus on the issue at hand. Okay. Yeah. Great, and be a spectator to your emotions, uh, detach. Mm -hmm. Detach without being overly, overly detached. Detached. Yeah, yeah. Right. I think with that, it's a good transition into our topic for today. Sure. Right, mental health and wellness definitely requires a good balance of detachment and compassion. You know, especially when it comes to issues like this. How do you define mental health personally? How do I define mental health? Yeah. Well, mental health, just like physical health, which is an indication of how well the body is doing. I think could be, in very layman terms, defined as how well our mind is doing. Mm. Right? So if we fall down, right, if we suffer a cut, we go to the either the clinic or we self-medicate at home, handy plants and whatnot. Mm. Uh, likewise, you know, mental health uh, really exists on a spectrum. And it could well be minor blips that we encounter on a day-to-day -day basis, stress, sustained stress over time, and then there could be different severity. So it's important to recognize that mental health actually exists in a wellness yeah. term, 
right? And not it's not binary. It's like whether you are good or bad. Yeah, yep. It's not one or zero. It's not like coding. <laughs> okay. uh, it's probably exists on a spectrum, and we need to recognize that. You know, the earlier we can, you know, reach out to somebody, the earlier we can reach out for help uh, and be mindful of uh, men- people with mental health conditions around us. The better it is for us to yeah. intervene. Yeah, it's, I strongly believe in that, right? It's not, it's not a category, it's a continuum. Mm-hmm. But because it's so easy in society to classify things, and I think by nature we have to because yeah. that's how our mind works. Yeah. But when we put things in the categories to understand things, sometimes mm-hmm. it blinds us to yeah. the nuances, the continuous, you know, different emotional states that we all go through. Mm-hmm. Um, and mental health is, a, is a, such a big and broad topic that everybody should be concerned about because everyone has a mind <laughs> and everybody's mind is important yes everyone has a mental health index yeah yeah so both on an individual and society level it's relevant and I think we don't need to spend too long on this because I think in the last two years especially a lot of people have been talking more about it share with us some progress that has been made in the recent years that has been positive in your own experience both in policy or also maybe on a cultural level mm. Mm. I think the great thing that came out from um, the past few years was that you know now everybody's not so shy to talk about mental health it used to be that hey you know mental health actually isn't really a thing yeah. that we talk about in society and this wasn't too far back it was probably five ten years ago you, you know people mm-hmm. don't really talk about it and people really just shy away from this topic yeah. even. And, and our understanding of it is really quite binary oh if you have a mental health condition are you saying you need treatment in mm-hmm. IMH for instance yeah. that was really the, the, the conversations back then right yep. this few years I think mm-hmm. awareness has been great uh, it's been on the rise um, but we do need to do more so the last survey that was done, I think, um, by the IMH, uh, the Singapore Mental Health Study, sure. that was, I think, in 2016, I think we are quoting yes, that. Yeah, right. um, little more than 50% of those who were uh, surveyed found that they um, can work with, live with, or live near somebody with mental health condition. Mm. That's the glass half full view. Mm. If you look at things glass half empty, it means uh, half of them half doesn't of want don't want yeah. to. Okay. Yeah, I'm not sure what the latest stats is. I think the, 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 the latest survey is being um, done and the results are being updated. But I do hope and I do think that society should have progress a little bit from 2016 yeah. to now. So that's a good thing that's happening in our society. Definitely, yeah. I think not just that, uh, in like COVID also is kind of a stressor. Yeah. We have a stressor that's adaptation. And the adaptation that we kind of put out is more focused, mm. right? More initiatives growing up. I mean, now there's a lot of mm. growing up initiatives. I think it's a tripartite um, alliance or something that was established to ensure that workplaces right. have access to mental wellness resources. Uh, schools especially also. And nowadays, they have this curriculum, CC curriculum, that needs to be rolled out, mm. I believe, by 2022 or 2025 where their peer supporters and different help and everything. But I think that's, so that's great. Now, all that is great, but I think with that also comes a new set of mm. challenges, a new set of things we got to work on. Mm-hmm. And I think it's something that we, we can discuss. La. Based on, despite all these, right, uh, what are some of the gaps that you still um, identify la, and what are the solutions? Let's talk about, so we're going to talk about the gaps and then immediately kind of share some solutions. Too. Sure, yep. sure. So as you mentioned, right, uh, in the past few years, so many groups have come out. Yeah. There's so many ground-up initiatives and uh, the collaborations between the different uh, community partners, the collaboration with the, between community partners and government agencies. So that's great. So take for instance, uh, the Youth Mental Wellbeing Network, mm. which MSF, MOE and MOH has uh, facilitated in the past few years. We started in 2019. Um, uh, 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 2020, I think. Yeah. Okay. So one of the great things is that we have had about 1,500 practitioners, professionals, caregivers, youth, parents, and so on and so forth, coming together and really forming ground-up groups. So mm. we have gotten about 20 over ground-up projects off the ground. Yep. So that's great. But I think in the midst of all this is also the fact that you know we have now such a large and diverse supply of the different services that has come out. Right. But where is the alignment? Where is the, the system? And where is the, the structure? And there needs to be some, um, if I can call it, consolidation of services, if you will. Yep. So I think that's where, um, you know, uh, things like the Interagency Task Force Mental Health and Wellness really comes in. This is led by SMS Janil. I'm also a member in this task force. Okay. So we have in this task force different partners, both from the community, from government, basically the 3P. Uh, treat pe- people, private and public sectors okay. coming together to try to have 
some sense of uh, assistance. Okay. So take for instance today, mm-hmm. I mentioned about cuts and about you know uh, maybe a fracture. Mm. You have a, a, a severe fracture, you go to the hospitals today, right? Yeah. If a minor cut, you don't. It's either to go to the GP downstairs or mm-hmm. you just self uh, yeah. deal with it yourself. People know. You People know, know which, where to go to. Yeah. Which part of this uh, quote unquote spectrum you yeah. go to, right? But today, if I, I have some yeah. mental health issues, right, uh, where do I go? Oftentimes, the advice, if we, even if we talk to anyone else in the first place, yeah. is that, oh, you go to IMH law. Mm. That's also part of the reason why IMH is uh, stigmatized, overwhelmed. Yeah. And uh, overwhelmed, yeah. yeah. And uh, in, a, in a sense, uh, we need to really also tear our healthcare system, our system today, to make sure that they are moderate, intermediate, as well as primary Interesting. within the community. So that's what the task force has got it. And that's, that's great. It's great to hear that. And I think the next step also is to communicate yes. to the general public. Indeed. Right? Because one thing is to have it there, but then yep. the next thing is to know that people to it's know not that. Help nobody knows. <laughs> <about> yeah. <laughs> yeah. And it's something that I guess we're all working on together. But as an individual, what can we do, you feel, to create more synergy? Or someone that's passionate about mental well-being you want to start an initiative or just any individual right yeah. as an individual I always preach the I can say preach right <laughs> sure, sure I always preach the three <laughs> L's okay yeah what I mean by three L's and I always say is look listen and then link okay and the three L has got to be supported by awareness of course right look simply meaning look out for how loved ones around you are behaving mm. normally or not so yeah not quite normally Sure. And uh, listen, really just listening out to what persons are saying, right? If they, you feel that something is amiss, then there's a good chance that something is amiss, mm. right? So look, listen, and check in, you know? Yeah. Just check in, hi, how are you? You know, how was your day? And how, how are you feeling? And notice yeah. that you have not been as humorous as you were in the past, you know? Yeah. Um, anything happening? So that check in, yeah. I think, helps to, you know, make a prod, make a probe. Uh, to that person just to at, at least let the person know hey somebody cares la, yeah. right and then if really there's a need for that person to seek help know where the resources are going to be and know you know who are the persons yeah. in his or her life who will be able to do that emotional check in definitely and I think this is something we'll check in detail in the third episode with one of the befrienders so right. I guess y'all can subscribe and tune in for that episode because we're gonna discuss that in detail right the, yep. the steps to do it but mm-hmm. in a nutshell I think it's really about being aware linking yes. being aware of the services in the community being aware of this network mm. Where where does this person fit in the network and how can you fit them in mm. without trying to be a savior, la, you know, yes. without trying to yes. make the person your entire world and vice versa. Don't have to be doesn't take yeah. a mental health, uh, you know, super high level, super skilled uh, kind of a professional yeah. in order to, to detect some some of these. Some of these are really about, you know, uh, our day to day connections and we know yeah. because it, even the mental health professionals wouldn't quite sure. know how that person is day to day. Speaking of connection, I think we can nicely transition into the second gap which yeah. we're discussing. Right. Um, you were sharing about how you know the service is there, but sometimes there's stigma, sometimes mm-hmm. there's judgment. Mm-hmm. Could you share a bit more about that in your experience, or maybe with SafePod, or just generally in society when you've gone to different places? I think with society today, everything is so fast paced, right? School is fast paced, work is fast paced. So you can imagine, like, you know, in a family where there's um, working parents, school going children. And if you just observe the family, take yourself out and observe the family from a third person's point of view, it will almost look like a mad rush every day. You're rushing to school, you're rushing to beat the traffic, you're rushing to get onto the uh, the last bus that goes to that make sure you goes to school and go to school and go to work on time. Mm-hmm. Um, and then you rush home, and then there's on weekends. There's so many things to go through uh, that we have to get through, right? How often? do we really have the chance to connect emotionally mm. with somebody, right? In our families, right? So if I were to look at the camera and ask you, right? Some of you, uh, all of you, you know, how often have you, when was the last time you have had a heart-to-heart talk, HDHT, with a family member? Mm. I'm not sure. I'm not sure if it's, you know, for most of us, it will be a, yep. an incident of, a, you know, of, a, of the recent past. And by extension to that, how often do we have a conversation with ourselves, mm. right? Because if we don't have a conversation with ourselves, I do feel that we can often get mired in the business day of to day, every yeah. day, 
yeah. but we don't really have that connection with ourselves, right? Mm. To really know, hey, what is it that I'm gunning for in life? What is it that I stand for? Mm. What are my values? What is it that I want to be remembered by if, you know, to yeah. my last day on this, on this earth? So I think that I think that there's a lot of scope for us to be a, little, a lot more mindful, mm. a lot more in touch with ourselves, our own being, and of course, our loved ones in okay. our lives. Great. I think we have one last talking point, mm -hmm. which is the intergenerational gap. Yeah. I think you mentioned to me offline. You want to explain a little bit more about this? Well, I think for the older generations, uh, mental health, uh, as I said, didn't used to be quite a thing. So they might say, hey, you are the young, younger generation, so strawberry, and then mm. you can just get on with life, and then just uh, you know, toughen up, and, and, and things like that. But I think we ought to also recognize that each generation have got their own uh, situational factors, environment, environmental factors that they grew up in. When um, my parents were much younger, mm. they didn't, or even when I was younger, I didn't grow up with social media. Yep. I didn't grow up with that environment that we are in. So I think it's, it's probably wise for the generations not to quickly point and figure a finger at each other and then say, oh, you uh, old foggies, you know, you don't understand mm. what we are, you know, today how can you call us strawberries? Mm. Or maybe for the older generations also to, to then take a step back and say, look, the challenges that each generation faces are, uh, face are quite different. Yeah. Yeah. So if you can all take a step back and then look at what goes specific circumstances are. Yeah, it goes back to your look listen you know precisely in a way in a way right <laughs> yeah 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 it's hard to do though i think yeah. we recognize that it's important but it's hard to do and something that i guess both of our both of us are passionate about yeah inspiring others to you know to see that yeah yeah i always like to say that you know we are differently resilient yes i don't like to say that I mean, there are points I can learn from the older generation in That's a way a they, they're more stoic in their approach. Yeah, so it's important to see things as what can I learn from them, yeah. right? And they are actually resilient under those conditions. Yes. But as a whole, for the younger generation, we might be differently resilient or resilient under different conditions mm -hmm. simply because the stresses that we grow up with are different, like you say, social media. Mm -hmm. um, what inspires us, what gives us meaning might be a little bit different as well. Exactly. So it's on both sides to really recognize these factors and build an environment where resilience uh, can flourish, lah. Yeah, essentially. And that goes back to the point earlier about connections, right? So yeah. how often do we have that connections, th those conversations ah, yes. within the family, so that we understand each other a bit better across the generations, mm. right? And I think a uh, case in point, if can raise one example just to um, illustrate this. This was recounted to me, so not my first-hand experience, but it was told to me by one of the psychologists that I have talked to. So she recounted this session where, you know, they've gotten primary six students as well as parents together in the same setting. Primary six, as we all know, in the Singapore context, is a very stressful year, yeah. right? D6, 12 years old, ooh, no joke. So in that session, the children will ask, right? They will ask, look, if you were stressed out, if you had mental health or mental wellness issue, issues, mm. who will you go to? So the parents were like, oh, of course me la. <laughs> so they had that look, you yeah. know. And true enough, many parents Friends. felt that, yeah. you know, actually, yeah, my kid would be the first, I'd be the first part of call for my kid. Mm. No doubts about that. But actually when the psychologist, you know, got the primary six children <laughs> to start sharing mm. and then the things that they say, you know, things like, you know, actually I wouldn't go to my parents. That's the first shocker. By and by, the P6 student also, I mean, the students also mentioned, actually alluded to the point that, you know, actually parents might be a, a big source of stress mm. for them in their lives as well. So I, I tell you, I was told that in that session, there was a lot of bawling because mm. there was so much coming to, hey, coming to the point that, hey, actually I'm not the superhero, no, mm -hmm. or my daughter or son. Actually, I'm also adding on or piling on to yeah. the stress that he, him or her is facing. When I heard that, I my heart wrenched a little bit. Yeah, yeah. In this session, first of all, I'm glad because there's a session where people can reconcile. Then you say connection, heart to heart. Indeed. So in the course of rushing through your every day or every week, I mean, 
if we can, if only we can just spare a little bit of time to just sit down, talk to each other, connect with each other, and have that much needed conversation. Mm. We don't really have to go the long journey, but the whole journey bottling up what we feel and what we think. That's so important. That's why a lot of times when I ask people, what do you think about a proposal? What do I think about this idea or whatever it is? I sometimes replace the word think. We feel. What do you feel? <laughs> this okay. What do you feel about today? What do you feel about this meeting today? They, they just transpired. Okay. Thank you so much for sharing. Well, that was so impactful to me. I'm hearing that story also. Um, I hope this is my dream also to facilitate and inspire such conversations among generations and among friends. You know, um, we're coming towards the end of the podcast, but we have a final segment. All right, it's a surprise segment for you. <laughs> <laughs> it's a, it's a, yeah, it's a ten question quick fire. Okay, sure. Yeah, yeah. So oh, you can ele- you can elaborate a bit, lah. Huh? There's no need to be one word answer. Okay. Share an experience that influenced who you are today. I guess it is my stint um, as a commander in the SCDF because I, I, I mean, it wasn't one specific incident or mm. one specific experience, but that opportunity to then work with many younger officers who were in the service then uh, to talk through some of their aspirations, you know, their dreams for the future, and then to really be a very small part of uh, nudging them on to take some right. of the steps that they need to take. To me, that was extremely fulfilling. What's the most rewarding part of being an MP? I think the most rewarding part is the ability or the chance or the opportunity to then journey with some of your residents who might be facing some difficult times in their life, helping them get through the obstacles and challenges. And the greatest challenge? Greatest challenge would be to do as many things as I can (laughs) at the same time. I wish I had 48 hours a day. Okay. (laughs) One person you admire and why? One person I admire at this moment in time, and I hope my wife watches this. My <laughs> wife. Well, she's um, like what they always say, right? That yeah. behind every man, there's always so, a yeah. woman. And I would add that behind every man, there needs to be a wise woman. woman. Okay. And she's really wise for, 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 for all the suggestions and advice that she's been giving me. And that she's been a strong pillar of support for the past uh, one and a half, two years. Okay. And many years before. <laughs> What is one of the best advices you have ever received? Wow. That has come to come from my wife, right? After the last <laughs> question. Yeah. I think the most recent advice which I received, actually not just from my wife, but from a lot of uh, quarters, is that, you know, pace yourself, mm. right? Don't uh, burn out because there's only one of you. Mm. Though <laughs> you're not going to be uh, able to replace yourself, you know, if you really run out of fuel and then still go on. You're not able to go on w- without fuel in a tank. Yeah. yeah, when was the last time you cried or teared, and why? That's quite frankly a lot of times. <laughs> <laughs> last time, just the last time. Uh, it wouldn't be too far back. Sometimes okay. I would think about things, and then uh, sometimes if I if I am at a play or if I watch a right. movie, uh, yeah, I, I can't remember the specific movie, but yes, I do tear. Why so? Is it because you're insp- inspired? What's the emotion that comes out? Well, the last... Well, I remember I was at the, a concert a few weeks back okay. and the, the sheer, you know, intense feelings that went through me because I, if you, don't, if you didn't know, I was a performer myself in, right. in school. I was a trumpet player, right? Okay. I was in a band, the school band. So the applause that you feel yeah. when you hear, when you hear a full concert hall, right. that brought me, I had a bit of tears at it. So yeah. Of course, I was Jewish, then I must make sure that <laughs> so nobody sees that. <laughs> sure, sure. Why not though? Why not though? I think it would be nice that like, you talk about vulnerability, right? Like yeah. maybe, maybe it's something that they said, hey, he's human as well. He's really liking this performance. But then it's something to consider. And the but I do know that certain image you need to portray as well. There's just so many things because recently <laughs> I'm also taking care of the, 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 the enabling master plan so yeah. I've had a chance to interact with so many caregivers, person with disabilities right. and uh, countless sessions. Call it. Just being touched by the experiences. Yes. Okay. Yeah. Um, what's the lowest point in your life? One of the lowest points and how do you overcome it? I would say when my grandma passed away in 2017, uh, that year, um, early part of the year, I lost my grandma. Um, I was close to her when I was young. 
gradually as I began school and I uh, you know because I when I was young I she took care of me I mm. actually uh, spoke quite a bit of dialect with her but by and by I lost the ability to converse in Hokkien mm. uh, so fluently mm. uh, because I then moved away from her so when she passed on that period of time gave me a lot of food for thought um, same year la- latter part of the year my my dog passed away mm. so uh, that's two family members uh, in, in one year so that year I remember reading much more about my religion and uh, getting in touch with myself much more mm. uh, so much so that sometimes I lament that nowadays I don't really get a chance as much to be in touch with myself to have a conversation with myself and to really think deep about what it means what life means Call it. for me last three questions uh, what is what does positive mental health mean to you positive mental health means um, on net you are mindful you know where you're going there'll be ups and downs doesn't mean that it's you know going to be on high every day but so long as you can manage those ups and downs I think that's doable okay with regards to mental health and wellness in society what is one change that you hope we can make or that you like to see in society Mm, I would like generally all of us to be able to take action Mm. Right. So we have talked about awareness, we have talked about knowing where resources could be, we have talked about each of us being that person who could be a resource for the person, for the next person, for our yeah. loved ones. So I think if we can be in that place where more more of us could be in that playing that role, we'll be in a good place. Okay. Final question, what is one last message you have for Singaporeans? Well, mental health is health and we all can do our part for mental health as well. Love it. Thank you so much, Eric, Thanks for the time much, you spent with me. Thank you. Uh, we have come to the end of today, but yes. of course, it's not the end of this conversation. Now, do check out SafePod at Queenstown. Of course, follow Eric on his social media as well. Uh, all the links are below. Um, you know, we hope that this episode has inspired you to connect with yourself a little bit better, to connect with people around you and overall contribute to a society that cares more, not just for the mind, but also for the heart. All right? So with that... Uh, Stay resilient and we'll see you on the next episode. Bye. Bye.